Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Alyssa Bustamante? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime and offer my analysis. Alyssa Bustamante was born in California on January 28, 1994. Her father's name was Cesar Bustamante. Her mother's name was Michelle. Michelle was only 15 years old when she gave birth to Alyssa. Alyssa's parents were cousins by marriage. When Alyssa was two years old, the family moved to St. Martin's, Missouri, so that Michelle could be closer to her mother, Karen Brooke. Karen and her husband, Gary, lived in Jefferson City at that time. This is about 15 minutes away from St. Martin's. Michelle had more children after arriving in Missouri, twin boys and another daughter. Caesar had difficulty regulating his intake of substances and was violent. He ended up being convicted of three counts of assault and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Michelle had a substance use problem as well. She was arrested several times for DUI, marijuana possession, and theft. Alyssa had a very challenging upbringing due to her parents' poor behavior. She would often go hungry. Her mother used substances in front of her. One time, her mother overdosed in her presence. Eventually, Child Protective Services removed Alyssa and her siblings from Michelle and sent them to live with her grandparents, Gary and Karen Brooke. As I mentioned, they had lived in Jefferson City, but they moved to St. Martin's after buying a ranch there. This gave their grandchildren plenty of room to play outdoors. In 2002, the grandparents became the legal guardians of Alyssa and her siblings. All the children did fairly well under the care of their grandparents, except Alyssa. She started using substances and would invest in violent fantasies. At age 13, she attempted to bring an end to her life using pills. She was taken to the hospital. The mental health professionals there were troubled by Alyssa's disturbing thoughts. Even though Alyssa was having a number of mental health and behavioral problems at home, she performed reasonably well at school. Her teachers viewed her as an excellent student. She did not really get into too much trouble in school. Alyssa dressed and wore makeup in a manner that did not attract attention in school, but when she was out of school, her preferences changed. She wore makeup in a manner so that she would resemble a clown or a vampire and she applied black eyeliner heavily. Using an alter ego she referred to as Bad Alyssa, she was active on social media. This activity revealed a number of unusual behaviors. For example, she bullied people, listed one of her hobbies as killing people. She spoke about terrors and addiction. Alyssa indicated that she hated authority, and she wanted to know the reason she suffered so much pain. She posted videos where she and her brothers would deliberately shock themselves on an electric fence. Alyssa appeared to get specific enjoyment from watching her brothers suffer. Alyssa frequently cut, burned, and bit herself, probably as a way of coping with her mental health symptoms. Alyssa started asking her friends if they wondered what it would be like to kill someone. So it seems clear that Alyssa didn't realize this feeling was unusual. She thought that perhaps her peers felt the same way. She repeated this question in a variety of settings, so it appeared as though she was really looking for someone to connect with at a homicidal level. Sometimes she would see a random student walking down the hall in school and tell one of her friends that she would like to kill that student. Around this time, Alyssa's six-year-old half-sister Emma Bustamante would occasionally play with a nine-year-old girl named Elizabeth Olton, who lived just four houses away. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On October 16, 2009, 15-year-old Alyssa Bustamante walked to the woods behind her house and dug two shallow graves. Five days later, on October 21, Emma Bustamante was playing with Elizabeth Olton at the Brook residence. Emma and Elizabeth arrived there at about 5 p.m. after Emma walked over to get Elizabeth. Just as Elizabeth started to walk back to her house at about 6 p.m., Alyssa called Elizabeth on her phone and lured her into the woods. 
Alyssa then attempted to strangle Elizabeth with her hands before stabbing her eight times with a kitchen knife and cutting her throat. Alyssa buried Elizabeth's body in one of the graves and placed leaves over the grave. She walked back to her house and washed the knife in the kitchen sink. After the homicide, Alyssa wrote a message in her journal admitting that she just killed someone. She said it was amazing. She indicated that the feeling was pretty enjoyable. She ended the entry by saying that she needed to go to church now. Elizabeth's mother notified the police at about 7 p.m. because Elizabeth never came home and would not answer her phone. The police questioned Emma Bustamante. She told them that around the time Elizabeth went missing, she noticed that Alyssa had blood on her pants. As the police searched for Elizabeth, Alyssa attended a church dance. That was the reference to church that she made in her journal entry. The police were able to ping Elizabeth's cell phone, which led them to the woods behind the Brook residence. They found an empty hole in the ground and brought Alyssa to that site. She admitted that she, in fact, did dig the hole, but she did it because she just liked digging holes. She would bury dead animals in these holes. It's not clear how she would come across these dead animals. The police thought this was peculiar, but at this point, they had not found anything but an empty hole. They searched Alyssa's room and found her journal. The entry about the homicide was scribbled over with blue ink, but the police were still able to read it. They interviewed Alyssa at the police station. After about an hour, Alyssa claimed that Elizabeth fell and died. She burned the body. After continued questioning, Alyssa finally admitted that she killed Elizabeth, although she initially stuck to the story that she burned the body afterward. Eventually, Alyssa revealed that she buried the body. On October 23, the police transported Alyssa to the woods where the murder occurred, and Alyssa revealed the location of Elizabeth's body. Alyssa was charged with murder. The court eventually determined that she would be tried as an adult. On January 10, 2012, about a month before her trial was to begin, she pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and armed criminal action. About a month later, she was sentenced to life in prison and 30 years to be served consecutively. She would have normally been eligible for parole in 2044. However, due to a law about juvenile offenders passed in Missouri, Alyssa is eligible for release after 15 years. It's not clear if this 15-year period starts when she was incarcerated or convicted. Therefore, Alyssa is eligible for parole as early as 2024 or as late as 2027. Now moving to my analysis. Alyssa received mental health counseling and was treated by physicians prior to committing murder. She had been prescribed Prozac. At the time of the murder, her dosage had recently been increased to 40 milligrams a day. After her arrest, her defense argued that Alyssa had been diagnosed with a number of mental disorders, including borderline personality disorder, major depressive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, what they referred to as anxiety disorder. It's not clear what exact disorder they're referring to. There is no disorder called anxiety disorder. Perhaps it was something like generalized anxiety disorder. They also indicated that Alyssa had symptoms of bipolar disorder. Mental health clinicians said Alyssa was psychologically damaged and severely emotionally disturbed. It seems fairly clear that she had developed mental health symptoms long before the homicide. Her behavior revealed a pattern of increasingly disturbed thoughts and behaviors. There were other disturbing journal entries in addition to the one Alyssa made after murdering Elizabeth. For example, Alyssa indicated that she wanted to burn a house down with a family inside. Alyssa's original plan may have been to kill her twin brothers. This is consistent with her digging two graves. She never admitted to this. We don't know if that was her plan. What happened in this case? Why did Alyssa commit murder? This is just a theory, my opinion. Due to Alyssa being mistreated when she was young, she became sadistic, antisocial, malicious, and angry. Alyssa suffered from the pain of depression. It was inescapable, always with her. It became increasingly difficult for her to feel pleasure or even to feel normal. She had developed a hatred for other people and a fascination with murder. She started to become fixated on the idea 
that the feeling of killing somebody would break her out of her own pain. It would allow her to feel something. Other sensation-seeking efforts were no longer sufficient. She needed something major to get her back to feeling normal or to feeling good. Normally, if someone reaches this state, their behavior would be regulated by empathy. So they may have these dark desires, but the empathy would compensate and they would not act. Alyssa had never developed empathy. The safeguard was not in place. Therefore, she was free to act on her homicidal desires. Moving to the last question, should Alyssa Bustamante spend the rest of her life in prison? This is a hotly debated issue in this case. Some people look at the horrible nature of the crime, including the age of the victim, and conclude that Alyssa should never be released. She is beyond redemption. Others noted that Alyssa was badly mistreated from when she was born until the age of eight. Society shaped her into the killer that she became, then accused her of choosing to be maladaptive. Alyssa was treated by mental health professionals on a regular basis. What did they do to help her? Why did they believe that she was not dangerous to others, even after determining she was dangerous to herself? Alyssa had literally written words on the walls of her bedroom in blood. She had posted disturbing messages on social media. Even though she did not appear as bizarre in school, it was still fairly obvious that she was hurting. Mental health clinicians even said that she suffered from horrible attacks of violence. How did they think that was going to turn out? I think Alyssa should probably spend about 25 years in prison and receive mental health care. There are just too many mitigating factors to justify life in prison. Putting all the blame on Alyssa is a simplistic answer to ease the conscience of society. Like she was just evil. She was born a killer. Let's put her in prison for life and forget about the epidemic of terrible parenting and the shortcomings of the mental health care system. Those are my thoughts on the case of Alyssa Bustamante. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.